Give me a mic. Thank you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is the Riley and Kimmy Show. Well, hello out there. It's me, Winnie the Pooh. And don't forget to remember to stay tuned to the Riley and Kimmy Show. And don't forget to remember to keep on bouncing, says Tigger. <laughs> Now, Kimmy, quit bouncing. You heard Tigger right there. You got to stop bouncing. None of that allowed here on our uh, set. Not allowed at all in the episode of uh, 440, or matter of fact, any episode of the Riley and Kimmy Show. I am your host, Patrick Riley. Right next to me is the bouncer. Kimmy, I got one name. Kimmy. Welcome to this episode of the Riley and Kimmy Show. Kimmy, we're going to go back in time here in just a moment or two. But first, it's time to talk about St. Patrick's Day, which... It was all fun and festive. If you go to our website at RileyandKimmy.com, you'll see some photos that I uh, uploaded, I published, of my adventure in all over Central Florida, one of the places being DeLand, Florida, visiting friends, and also have a photo of some Irish garb that I'm wearing. Matter of fact, I don't have any photos, though, with you and me with my Irish garb. That's because you refused allow me to take a photo of us together hmm why is that no no i i, I don't know what why is that kimmy you, I, don't, I don't know well okay was it the shirt no was it the hat mm. what was wrong with the hat i think any leprechaun would have been proud to have seen me in that hat don't you mm-hmm. i will tell you this much a lot of people were smiling at me especially in downtown the land when i was wearing the hat. Um, then they were. Oh, were you? Th- are are you thinking they were thinking nasty, naughty thoughts about me wearing that hat? Like, ooh, there goes a crazy man. <laughs> do, you, do, you think, do you think that's? Well, where's the where's the truck with the net and the straight jacket? <laughs> Is that what you're thinking? Well, no, Kimmy, that's not nice. You be a judge for yourself. Go right to our website which is RileyandKimmy.com. You can see the photos. And by the way, you know, once you're there, we have links to social media uh, sites, everything we're connected to. We'd love to be connected to you. Uh, and just uh, you know, follow us, like us, and we do the same right back with you. Now, Kimmy, do you know what day it is? It's Wednesday. That's right. Being a Wednesday, it is a way back Wednesday. I guess you're wondering about this contraption. Well, what is it? Well, actually, it's a time machine. I call it a way back. We just set it, turn it on, open the door, and there we are. Or were, really. That's what we're doing today. We're going back in time, Kimmy. We're going way back in time, back to June 2nd, 1949. And we're going to an old-time radio show that is featuring a star who's having a birthday coming up. I thought we'd, uh, we'd give a tribute to this star who's having a birthday on, let's see, next Monday, the 23rd of March. And that is Joan Crawford, hmm. the actress Joan Crawford. Now, I'm just kind of curious. You're familiar with Joan Crawford, right? Mm-hmm. Is there a favorite Joan Crawford movie? Mm. Wow. I don't know. Mm. I would assume you'd say Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Okay. You know, with Betty Davis and her as being maybe one of your favorites. Okay. I'm not certain. I know you saw that in a uh, old time theater that showed nostalgia films. Up in your uh, hometown, we saw that one together. I'd seen it many, for many, many, many times before that as I studied film. And I know that was the first time you ever actually saw it, even mm-hmm. though it was played quite often on WGN at one time in Chicago. So I, I have a feeling that might be one of your favorites, maybe. Okay. Yeah, maybe. I, I will have several that I recommend that are sort of off the radar. That one is a iconic classic one that you should check out. But I have a few others that we will say for an upcoming episode, we'll talk about of what to check out, you know, okay. of Joan Crawford's sort of the Patrick Riley recommended list. How's that? All right. The unofficial movie critic recommendation. Mm-hmm. There we go. So we are focusing on Joan Crawford, by the way. So you, you have at least her image in your head. What year do you think she was born? Hmm. And I'll tell you this much. She passed away in 1977. Um, 
1920. She was born in 1904. Oh, okay. Now, I want you to think of this. 1904, right? Uh-huh. Okay, in 1970, which would make her how old, Kimmy? 66 years old. Yeah. Okay. She was playing in a science fiction fantasy film called Trog, which I consider one of the worst science fiction fantasy films ever made. Mm -hmm. That's where they find a living, breathing troglodyte. Mm -hmm. And she she goes to find the living, breathing troglodyte with the shortened name of Trog and befriends Trog. Mm. It's sort of like King Kong caveman movie fused together. Uh It's set in the modern day, you know, where somebody brings the prehistoric type creature to society and it does not work out. It's a horrible film. We have the movie trailer. That's really all you need to watch. You can just see, well, you can see the extent of the special effects. In my opinion, you remember the TV show Land of the Lost? Mm -hmm. It had a better special effects thing going than Trog does. And Trog was a motion picture. This was, yeah, this was her last major film. (laughs) She quit sort of like after Trog. But she did something before that. She is in the pilot of Night Gallery. From 1969, Hmm. she does an episode called Eyes. Now, Eyes is worth checking out, and we have it on our website at RileyandKimmy.com. In case you've never seen it, the reason... Now, keep in mind, she would be, let's see, let's do the math, 65, Mm -hmm. okay? A very young individual makes his directorial debut, Kimmy, with Eyes. Any clue who it is? Mm. 1969. This is a director you know. I don't know. Steven Spielberg. Really? Very young Steven Spielberg directs Joan Crawford in Eyes. Mm. So you will want to check that out. We have that right on our website at RileyAndKimmy.com. Sort of our way back Wednesday kind of thing. But we're even going to go further back to something that is so cool. By the way, she wasn't born Joan Crawford. Any guess what her real name was? Um, nope. Lucille Faye LeSueur. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. And they didn't think that would work out in Hollywood. (laughs) And what they did is they ran a publicity contest to name her. MGM did this. Now, she started out in the silent era. Think about this. Mm -hmm. She's one of the very few actors or actresses that made it from silent to sound to talkies. Very Mm -hmm. few did. And that, by the way, if you love the movie Sunset Boulevard, that is something that's kind of referred to in that movie about the talkies coming in and then the silent era stars just going away. They didn't make the transition. She did. Well, MGM decided to have a contest to name her and the name that was chosen was Joan Crawford Mm -hmm. and she did not like the name Mm. but signed on with MGM and so the rest is you know what happened Mm -hmm. but one of the cool things about her during this time period Crawford worked tirelessly on her voice and pronunciation she would do this by reading newspapers and books aloud and just kept working on it and working on it I mean people say she was almost manic and her work ethic did help her survive Hollywood's movies that were silent Mm -hmm. to talkies. Hmm. She's one of the few. And those skills that she honed played well for her in radio. She was no stranger to radio at all. She did a ton of radio programs. Uh, Starting all the way back, her first uh, performance was in 1935 by her second husband, and she continued to do radio shows right through the 1960s. Hmm. She loved it, as a matter of fact. So she was no stranger to fans in film or radio at all. And the one we're going to right now is from a show that I consider probably one of the best old-time radio shows, and it's called Suspense, a radio drama series broadcast on CBS Radio from 1942 to 1962. Suspense went through several major phases characterized by different hosts, sponsors, and directors and producers, but the formula, plot devices, were followed for all but a handful of episodes. Now, the show usually had a protagonist that was usually a normal person, suddenly dropped into a threatening or bizarre situation. Solutions were withheld until the very last possible second, and evildoers were usually punished at the very end. Now, with that being said, I think Kimmy will know at least two television shows that suspense influence. Can you name them? 
Alfred Hitchcock. That's right. Alfred Hitchcock's hour, and well, presents an Alfred Hitchcock's hour. Definitely influenced by that. Mm -hmm. And the other one is Twilight Zone, without mm -hmm. a doubt. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to June 2nd, 1949. The episode is called The Ten Years. Here's Joan Crawford, who's having a birthday coming up on March 23rd. Our way of celebrating with our tribute here on The Riley and Kimmy Show. Suspense. Tonight, transcribed, Autolite brings you Miss Joan Crawford in The Ten Years, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. And now, Autolite presents Joan Crawford in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Everyone is so good to me. I like being here. But some of the others don't, I guess. Do you hear? They scream sometimes like that in the night. Maybe they scream because they remember things. But I remember things, too. Especially when people come out from town to see me. To bring me things. But there's nothing. Nothing that I want. They can't bring back my sister. My beautiful sister Adele. They came today. And with them they brought back memories of Adele. When we were children. The night that Mother died. The night we made the promise. Don't cry anymore, Adele. I'm afraid, Clara. We're alone. We're not alone. But if something happened to you... Nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to take care of you. But that's what Mother said. And now she's left us, too. But Adele, <laughs> Mother didn't know that she... She wouldn't have left us if she could have helped us. Promise me you won't die, Clara. And that whatever I do, you'll do. And that... And that you'll never leave me. I promise. And we'll be together... Always and forever. Always and forever. I promise. And for years I kept that promise. Adele and I were as close as anyone could be. We had few friends, but I didn't mind as long as she was happy. But sometimes I was frightened at the way she clung to me after we were grown. I was afraid of what would happen to her in case anything ever happened to me. And then something did happen. I met Douglas Foley. Adele liked him until she realized that I'd fallen in love with him. Then she hated him in a childish, vicious way. He tried to win her over, but it was no good. And then he asked me to marry him. And I said yes. That night, after he'd gone, Adele was waiting for me in my room. Adele? Clara! Douglas told me. Adele, you're so white. You're ill. But you promised me. But Adele, I'm not leaving you. You're going to live with us. No, it won't be the same. You promised always and forever. But we were children, Adele. You promised. We'd be together always and forever. But Adele, I... You, you see, Clara, Clara, if you marry him, I'll never speak to you again. But we were married. And we believed that Adele would forgive us in time. But she didn't. She refused to see us and letters went unanswered. Then when we learned that my husband's new job was to take us to Europe, our first thought was of Adele. If she would only go with us. But when we drove to her house, she refused even to come to the door. And we were forced to sail without her. My son, Doug, was born in Europe. And I wrote Adele a long letter telling her about him. But the letter was returned unopened. When Doug was just ten, we returned to America. I went directly from the station to Adele's house. She was working in the garden when we drove up. 
I was shocked at her appearance. Her hair had turned almost white, and there was a strange look about her. I sent Doug to the gate to introduce himself. She looked at him in a puzzled manner. Then she saw us sitting in the car. And she turned and walked into the house. The next thing I remember was that day, one month after my return home, when I was put on trial for murder. For my husband's murder. Mrs. Foley, will you tell us again what happened the night of your husband's murder? My husband was working in the garden all day. When it began to grow dark, I called him in. But he insisted that he had something to finish. I called him several times after that. And then I became irritated and I gave up. I had my dinner alone and I went up to my bedroom. Then you do admit that you quarreled with him the night of the murder. We didn't quarrel. I was irritated, but I said nothing to my husband. I see. Your husband's death was caused by a deep, narrow wound in the vicinity of the heart. It is the opinion of this court that the instrument used might have been an ice pick. Mrs. Foley, have you any other ideas as to what might have inflicted this wound? No. Had your husband any enemies, Mrs. Foley? No. And so I was acquitted that day because of insufficient evidence... I thought Adele would come to see me during those awful days, but she didn't. I saw her in the courtroom, but she never looked my way. I believe it was about two months after the trial that my son and his friend Roy went on an all-day hiking trip to the beach. They were late getting back. It was almost dark when I saw Roy coming up the street. He was alone, and he was running. Mrs. Foley! Mrs. Foley! Roy, where's Doug? He's down at the beach! With her. With whom? Your sister. My sister? Oh, for heaven's sake, Roy, will you tell me what this is all about? Well, you see, Mrs. Foley, Doug and I went down to the beach. It seemed that Roy and Doug had forgotten to take along their drinking water. And they hadn't missed it until they'd come to a very deserted strip of the beach. Come on, Doug. Maybe we can get some water at that little house over there. Funny place for a house, isn't it? Yeah. Come on. Looks like nobody lives here. All the better. And just drink out that faucet in the yard. We won't have to ask nobody. Come on. Sure run down, ain't it? Maybe the faucet isn't working. The garden's all dead. Sure it's working, see? Someone's just plain lazy then. Or maybe no one lives here. Well, sure they do. There's a mailbox. Hey, maybe there's a name on it. Look. Miss Adele Norris. That's Mom's sister. Yeah? Well, let's drop in and see her. She wouldn't even know who I was. You could tell her, couldn't you? Say, maybe she'd give us some cake or something. No, she's mad at me and Mom. Come on, let's get out of here. Say, Doc, look at all those dead leaves on the porch. Let's have a look around. No, she might come out. Oh, she can't hurt you, can she? Let's peek in the window. No, Rod. Look, Doug. The place is all upset. It's all dirty and everything. Let's look in the rest of the windows. There's no one around. Here's the kitchen. Hey, look at all the dirty dishes piled up. Say, maybe my aunt's sick. Look, someone's coming to the window. Oh! What do you want? We wanted to see if you were all right. Go away. Don't you recognize me? No. Are you sick? No. I'm your nephew... Douglas Foley. Go away, whoever you are. I- I'd like to help you. Go away, I said. Mother wouldn't want me to leave you here like this. Who is your mother? I told you. Don't you remember? She's your sister. I have no sister. My sister died when I was 18. Roy, you go home and get my mother. My aunt's sick. I'll climb through this window, and I'll see if there's anything I can do. You stay out of this house. Doug, let's both go. She doesn't want you here. She's sick. You go for my mother... And hurry! If you come into this house, you'll be sorry. If you dared! Did you say your name is Douglas Foley? Yes, that's right. Douglas Foley is dead. Forever and ever. No, don't you see? The one who died was my... Douglas Foley became between two sisters. And then he died. Yeah, but I'm trying to tell you. My mother and you... But he isn't dead. 
Then I guess he'll have to die again. That's it. Yes, he'll have to die again. He'll have to die again. He'll have to... Look, you're sick. You need help. I'm sick? Yes. Don't you want me to come in? Yes. Come in. Douglas Foley. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Joan Crawford in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage... Miss Joan Crawford as Clara in The Ten Years by Mel Dinelli. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You see how clearly I remember things? I remember so well the horror of that moment when Doug's little friend finished telling me how he had left Doug there alone with my sister Adele. And I even remember what Roy said at the end. So I came back to tell you, Mrs. Foley, on account of Doug made me. Now I wish I hadn't left him there with her. I know she's your sister and all, but I saw her face when she came to the window. She looked awful, Mrs. Foley. She looked awful crazy. I followed Roy's directions and I went by foot north along the ocean. I must have walked a good mile before I came to the house. The front door was standing open. There was a lamp burning on the table. Adele. She lay on the bed. I couldn't see her very clearly by the candlelight. But I could see that she was fully dressed. Her hair was undone and it spilled down over the pillow. For a moment I thought... I thought she was dead. What do you want? Adele. What do you want? It's me, Clara. Where's Douglas? He's dead. Adele! Your husband is dead, I I don't say. mean my husband. I mean my son. Where is he? He was murdered with a long shot. Be still! You don't know what you're saying. Where is my son? I haven't seen him. You have? He was here, I know that. I haven't seen him. Yes, you have. Try and remember. Where is he? I don't know. Yes, you do know. What have you done to him? Was he your son? Yes, Adele. Please. I hated him. I know. Where is he, Adele? He went away. Where? Where did he go? He went to the village for a doctor. Are you telling me the truth? Yes. How long ago did he leave? I don't remember. Will you stop questioning me? Can't you see that I'm sick? I tell you, he went for a doctor. Why do you come here, Clara? After ten years. I've come to help you. I don't need your help. Adele, did Doug really go for the doctor? You think I'm lying? I don't know. But if he isn't back soon, I'm going for the police. The police? Those fat... I'm so sick, Clara. I know. I'm going to take your things off, Adele. You'll be more comfortable. Then when the doctor comes, if he comes... Don't you touch me! You're sick, Adele. Let me take your things off. No, no! Can't you leave me alone? Leave me alone! How do you know what's good for me after all these years? (laughs) I'm in pain, Clara. I have a heavy pain here by my heart. When I'm tightly laced, I can almost bear it. All right. All right, darling. We'll leave it till the doctor comes. Will the doctor help me, Clara? Of course he will. Douglas Foley came between two sisters. Oh, dear. He worked in the garden, bending down low. I'm so tired, Clara. I know. Try and rest, Adele. Close your eyes. He was working in the garden. And I was on my way home. I saw him there, Clara. 
He looked the same after ten years. Because he had your strength to draw from. But I was alone. I had grown old. And he had stayed young. Young. And then he... And then she seemed to doze off. Her breathing was so labored. And I thought, perhaps she'll rest more easily if I undress her. And I went over to the bed. She was wearing a corset. I reached over and I began to unhook it. She started mumbling something in her sleeve. You broke your promise. Always and forever, you had said. But she didn't wake up. Always. And I finally managed to take her corset off. But as... As I went to place it on a chair, I noticed something sticking out of the material. At first, I thought it was a broken stay, but it was round, and one end was sharp. I looked closer. It was a steel knitting needle. A long steel one. And there was rust on it. Or was that brown stain rust? Adele had concealed a knitting needle, and there was proof of what I guess I'd always known, that Adele had murdered my husband. I dropped the needle to the floor. Then something caught my eye. There was a hand sticking out from beneath the bed. It was white and still. It was a child's hand. I fell to my knees. Oh, Doug. Doug. And just as I reached out for him, I... I felt a sharp blow on the back of my head. And I fell unconscious. I dreamed. I dreamed that Adele and I were children again. And that she was laughing. And we were playing an old game of ours where we tied each other up with our bathrobe cords. And then we waited for a knight in armor to rescue us. And then I think it was the odor of kerosene that brought me to. The room was filled with it. Oh, my head was pounding. I couldn't seem to focus my eyes. I tried to raise myself to my feet, but I... I... I couldn't seem to move my arms, my legs. Suddenly, I realized why. I was tied with a bathrobe cord. I was a child again. Adele and I were playing our games again. My husband and everything that had happened between Adele and me had been nothing but a bad dream. Oh, a feeling of relief swept over me. And suddenly, I, I heard footsteps... And the door creaked slowly open. And then I knew that what had happened had not been a dream. For Adele stood there in the doorway. Not Adele, the child who would rescue me. But Adele with gray hair who hadn't spoken to me for all those years. She wore a long dressing gown. She was barefoot. Her long hair streaming about her shoulders. And there was a vacant, stupid smile on her face. She carried a bucket in her hand. And the odor of kerosene filled the room. She didn't seem to notice me as she went past me. She threw the liquid from the bucket onto the bed. Adele! No, Adele! But she paid no attention to me as she left the room again. I struggled. I struggled wildly, but it was no use. Oh, I was tied securely. and Then I saw a still figure on the bed. It was Doug. Oh, his face was so white. He was unconscious, and there was a deep gash at the side of his head. And then Adele came back into the room. She had filled that bucket to the brim, and she walked toward the bed again. Clara? Adele, untie me. Untie you? Why? Adele, listen to me. This is your son, Clara. Yes, yes, Adele, untie me. We were looking for him. And he was here all the Please, time. Please, untie me, Adele. I never knew your son. For years, I never knew him. How old is he, Clara? He's only ten. He's just a boy. Adele, you're sick. Untie me and we'll go for a doctor. You want me to be well, Clara? Yes, untie me. Are we friends again, Clara? Yes, we're friends. I want to help you. But I can't forget the ten years, Clara. <gasps> I must wash those years away before we can really be friends oh, again. Oh, Adele, forget those years. Let me help you. Don't tie me now. No. We can't forget them, Clara. 
We must wash them away. That's what I was doing. I was washing away the years. Your husband's gone. Your son is all that remains of him. Then we can be sisters again. You don't know what you're doing. Untie me, Adele. But this isn't water that I have in the sink. No, you, you see, you're sick. It's what I put into the lamps to make them burn. No! I I could burn away the years. Oh! Then that would be better. Oh, Much no! better. No, no, Adele, for the love of heaven, untie me! I could burn away these years that remain on the bed. No, Adele! If I could do that... With this candle. Then you and I could really be friends again. Like when Mother was alive. We could be sisters again. Always and forever. We're, we're sisters now, Adele. You're lying. We're not sisters. Adele, listen to me. We're, we're children. And you've tied me with this cord. And now you must untie me. Like, like you used to do when you left me too long and I cried. You're lying. We're not sisters, and we haven't been for years. And now I'm going to punish you for lying, just as Mother used to punish us when we were children. Then she started walking unsteadily toward me, a lighted candle in one hand, the bucket in the other, the liquid slopping over her dressing gown as she walked. Clara, do you remember the time Mother washed out my mouth with soap when she caught me in a fib? That's what I'm going to do to you now. Or perhaps it would be better if I burned you. Clara! No! Clara, to awaken your precious son. We mustn't waken him. <laughs> Adele, Adele, untie me. I, I promise you that I'll take Doug and we'll go away. You'll never have to see us again. Oh, no, Clara. And she kept moving toward me, holding the lighted candle close to her breast. You mustn't ever lie to me again, Clara. Adele, Adele, you're ill. You don't know what you're doing. Wash away the years. Burn away the years. Oh, suddenly, I saw a tiny flicker of flame on her breast. The frilly dressing gown, she had held the candle too close. Her entire dressing gown was a mass of flames that spread swiftly to her hair. In a moment, she was a blazing torch. And the odor of burning filled the room. I can see her face. Surprised and contorted with pain. Ah! Well, she turned and looked towards the bed a second, the bucket flaming in her hand. Ah! But then she went screaming out the door and towards the sea. Ah! Ah! You mustn't scream like that. I wasn't screaming. That was my sister, Adele. Yes, I know. Try not to think about it, Mrs. Foley. You knew my sister was burned to death, didn't you, Mrs. Willard? Oh, she was so very beautiful. Yes, I know. Try and rest. Is there anything I can get you before I go to bed? No, thank you. Well, go to sleep then. I will. Good night. Good night. And pleasant dreams. Was that my sister, Mrs. Willard? No, no, Mrs. Foley. It's one of the others. Oh. They scream because they remember things. Yes. Yes, I suppose they do. Good night. Good night. I remember things, too. I remember... Promise me you'll never leave me, Clara. And that whatever I do, you'll do. I promise. Always and forever. Always and forever. I promise. Thank you, Joan Crawford, for a magnificent performance. Now here again is Miss Crawford. I want to thank Tony Leader and his wonderful cast of actors, especially Lorene Tuttle, who played my sister, for helping me to make my appearance on Suspense so very pleasant. Like all of you, I am a great Suspense fan, and I'm looking forward to hearing next week's story. It's another gripping study in... 
Suspense. 